Is that sharing now or no? Oh, no, you know, you, yeah, I think you have to open it. There you go, you open your PowerPoint, make it bigger. And how about now? It, it, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Fine. Perfect. So, um, malignant spine cord compression, and here's some some of the pictures that we all we all see in our practice. Um, I mean, to start off with, how how do these how do these patients present? And a lot of these things are what are the stuff that you find in in textbooks, to be honest. And often it's more subtle because we have more and more patients surviving for longer and longer with cancers, um, with improvements in chemotherapy, radiotherapy techniques. But generally speaking, they can present with uh, spine pain, um, and it can be severe and unremitting, but not all, all, always. It can be sort of mild pain. Um, but any new pain in a cancer patient, obviously, is, a, is something that would, would warrant um, an investigation and imaging. And that kind of pain could be um, of sort of a ridiculous type nature, uh, especially when it's aggravated by strain and coughing or sneezing. You can have tenderness when examining the spine could be nocturnal pain and that's something that generally worries us about whether there's an infection or a, or a malignancy an underlying malignancy in the spine um you can have neurological symptoms clearly if if the neurological elements are compromised and that could range from ridiculous type pain to then weakness and difficulty in walking or sensory disturbance and also bladder and bowel dysfunction and in, in, the, in the same way um, if there is neurological compromise, then, then there may be signs on clinical examination which, which point to that. Um, the aims of treatments, and I think this is uh, one, of, one topic where I generally in, in your surgery, you want to simplify your thought process in my view. That's, that's how I practice at least. And I think more so in this, in this topic, because I see residents, especially often when, they, when they're first introduced to the topic, they can get confuse why we chose conservative management or radiotherapy management for one patient and surgery for another. So I think it's, it's important to funnel your thought process. And in order to do that, you need to know what the aims of your treatments are. And I've summarized them in these four points. So the first one is, is what we're predominantly concerned with as neurosurgeons, which is um, neurological function and how to, to keep that for as long as possible. And the second point is what we're worried about as spine surgeons is spine stability and how to maintain that. And then more from an oncological aspect, it's going to be pain control and oncological control. Um, and oncological control can, can include radiotherapy, and these are the, the various terminologies that people use for, for that. So SRS, SBRT, or SABR. But they all refer into localized radiotherapy techniques. So with that in mind, what are the, what are the treatment options? They're, they're, they're one of three, generally speaking, one of three. I'm gonna be systemic treatments, and that's chemo, radiotherapy, sorry, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, or hormonal, hormonal therapy. And the second management option is radiation treatments. And the last one is surgery. And, and again, clearly here as a, on, a, on, neurosurgical, on a neurosurgical talk, we're gonna be mostly concentrating on, on the role of surgery. But that's not to forget the other, the other pillars of management here. Um, decision making. Again, keeping in mind what the aims of treatment are, we can get to the points which are important to consider in the decision making process. And I can summarize them in these four points. So we want to know the degree of cord compression, the epidural spinal cord compression, and that will reflect in neurological compromise and preserving neurological function. We want to know the nature of the tumor. So is it radiochemosensitive, et cetera? We want to know the, how the patient is overall, so the extent of the systemic disease and medical comorbidities. Then lastly, we want to know about spinal stability. So if we have answers to these four points, we'll be able to um, come up with a management, a management plan for, the, for, the, for our patients. And again, just carrying on from that, when we assess our patients, it's going to be with those factors in mind. 
Um, so we're looking for a neurological assessment. Is there any weakness or any brisk reflexes, et cetera, any signs of cord or nerve compromise? And then the second um, um, assessment method is going to be oncologic. And, and by that, I mean, we need to know the tumor histology. And it could be that patients already had a, a malignancy, which we know about, or it could be that we need to find that out from a CT staging scan. And then when we have that provisional diagnosis or confirmed diagnosis, we, we will know whether it's radio or chemosensitive. And then we need to find out about mechanical stability or instability. Um, and lastly, about the overall condition of the patient, and that includes medical comorbidities and systemic disease. So there's a lot of information which we need to find out about um, the patient with malignant spine cord compression prior to reaching um, a treatment strategy. So I'm going to start with um, some cases, and we can either at the end of the case ask for some interjections, um, John, or we can just carry on and go through a few cases, um, which will hopefully clarify what I've just, what I've just um, explained in terms of the treatment principles. So there's case number one, 63 year old um, gentleman who has a history of real cell cancer. Before he presented to me, he had a nephrectomy a year earlier. Um, when he did present, he had four small pulmonary metastases or nodules. He came with low thoracic back pain in a, in a patient with history of cancer. Obviously that's a, that's a flag which warrants an investigation. He did, however, have intact neuro neurology and normal gaits. And when we, when we discussed this, this um, case with the oncologist, um, the opinion was that he had over 12 months of prognosis, which is a, a reasonably good prognosis for a cancer patient. These, these, are, these are the patient's MRI scans. So I think people can see my um, cursor here, but um, you can see... No, I can... Let's see, you want a point, right? Yeah. Uh, you may have to go into the settings of your computer. Are you familiar with your settings at all? Uh, yeah, you have to go into your Windows settings. It might be a little difficult now. Okay, well, let's leave that for now. Back, but, um, yeah, next time we'll do it. Let's try and remove and come out from this one. We can, we can just have a look according to what you're saying, Rafi. That's fine. Yeah, okay. For some reason, the slides aren't moving now, so I need That's to okay. Them. That's all right. Yeah. We're learning. We're learning this tech. Maybe stop sharing your screen and start again. I think it just is slow, but hold on a minute. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. If that works, yeah. So yeah, here's the MRI scan, and on the left of your screen, you'll see a, a, a sagittal T2. And at um, when it, um, at T12 is, um, is that lesion um, that you see. Um, and on the right of the screen are the axial scans. And I put a, a, an axial scan of the level of, of, the, of this metastasis and an axial scan at a normal level. Um, and you can see that this uh, metastasis is coming through the posterior part of the um, vertebral body and into the epidural space or the canal. And, and the, the nerve roots at that level are slightly clumped together. So, and this is the patient's CT scan, and I'm gonna scroll through this. So you can see there's a lytic lesion um, involved in the body. It goes just about to the pedicle on one side. Um, not quite to the pedicle on the other side. This is the axial scan. Yeah, as you can see, sort of disconnected the pedicle from the body, as it were, and this lytic lesion. This is what the operation that the patient had, so a posterior um, minimally invasive um, percutaneous pedicle screws, and then as a second stage, um, we had a thoracotomy and debulking of this tumor and insertion of a cage. Question is why, why, why I chose to operate on him and, and why that's operation. So we come back to these, which I'll be continuing to come back to these four points of assessment. And, and if we think about the neurological assessment for this patient, 
the way to reach that, and you, you heard me mention things like um, epidural compression and extension of the tumor in the canal, um, there is, a, there is a, a common language for this, which we don't often use, um, but I think can be useful, especially on the phone when, when conveying a message about these kind of patients, is an epidural spine cord compression scale. And in, in summary or, or crudely, we can, we can summarize it into either a low-grade compression, which are, which are tumors or metastases confined to the, confined to the bone, or a high-grade, which is, which is a tumor which is compressing the nerves but, or the cords. If we want to go into more detail, then we can look at this six, it's a six points um, system. And generally speaking, the patients that we're going to manage are going to be anywhere between uh, 1B and 3, usually. Um, but it's a, like I said, it's a good method to sort of communicate um, exactly the level of compression. So um, 1A, as you can read there and you can see on, on the images, is epidural impingement. So it's going through the canal, but no, no deformation of the, of the fecal sac. 1B just about reaches the um, fecal sac, but it doesn't, doesn't compress the nerves or the spinal cords. And 1C, it deforms the fecal sac and also reaches the spinal cords, but doesn't cause frank cord compression. And then um, grade two on that scale, there is um, cord compression, but you can still see CSF around the cords. Then grade three is compression when you see no CSF around the cords. So in the case, I had mentions, if we go back to the MRI scan, you'll see this is a probably either a 1C or a 2. So it's going through the canal, certainly a button in the fecal and reaching the nerves, um, not, not quite frankly compressing them. Maybe. That's the first way to assess these is neurologic. Um, the second is oncologic. Um, and, and for this, it's a tumor histology. So for the patient that I've just um, given presentation on, we knew that he was um, renal cell cancer. And we know that renal cell cancer is generally um, uh, not as responsive to um, radiation treatment as others. And we have the hematological type malignancies, which are very radiosensitive, like lymphoma, myeloma. And, and for those kind of tumors, we will be concentrating more with radi radiation treatment as a management option. When you have radio-resistant tumors, we will, be, we will be thinking more about surgery. Um, and then when you, when you combine that with the, with the degree of compression, you can come up with this table. So generally speaking, when, there's, when they're radiosensitive tumors, you're going to go for radiotherapy. Even if there is code compression, it's an option. Uh, but dependent on the, all the other factors that we spoke about as well. When it's radio resistance, you're going you're to be thinking about um, surgery, especially if it's a high-grade compression. When it's a low-grade compression, you can still think about localized radiation treatments because it can have good control rates. Or in block sorts of surgeries um, as an option too. This is just some information about SRS, which we can skip through. So um, the, the question is for the high grades, you know, which do you go for, surgery or radiotherapy? I mean, SRS is a, is a, is a, um, a type of radiation treatment, but we did study um, the outcomes of, of these kind of patients with radiotherapy alone versus surgery and radiotherapy. And the Patchell study is the, is the paper most quoted um, for this, it's a randomized multi-center trial. And patients with malignant spine cord compression were randomized to either surgery followed by radiotherapy or radiotherapy alone. And it gave some good data and it's what um, a lot of um, spine surgeons, neurosurgeons use for their, for their practice um, to guide their treatments. Um, because we know that significantly more patients in a surgery group were able to walk after treatments. And we know that the walking distance, which was much better with the surgery group. We also know that the dependency on corticosteroids and opioid analgesics were much less in the surgery group. So it has good evidence to to, to decide to go to surgery rather than radiotherapy alone. So that's case number one. I mean, uh, should we go for questions about this or do you want me to go to the second patient? I don't know if Monsal, you've read any of the comments or if they're, if they're there. Do we, are we commenting or are we sort of, are we letting pe pe people in to, to ask questions, um, John? Uh, whatever you prefer. Mahood, what do you want to do? Um, I Monsal, didn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, 
I haven't seen any comments from anybody. I've just opened the chat section. Um, but I, I think it's a um, good opportunity to ask some questions. And um, can I make a comment, uh, Rafi, um, if I may? I think you know, it's a very good summary. Is it OK just to make a quick comment? Um, sure. Yeah. What I find interesting is um, being new to this particular platform is how many colleagues are, are connecting from around the world. And um, I think it goes without saying that we can't be perhaps too prescriptive about standards. And what's very interesting is that you, um, in your excellent presentation, Rafid, you, you're highlighting all the simple principles that go about classification, grading, aims, and etc. Uh, and I just have a lot of sympathy depending on where people work. For example, when I visited colleagues in the United States and Canada, and particularly over the years in the UK, I know our standards have changed. So, you know, operating on an 80 year old with a lot of comorbidities um, might be something that is much easier to do in the USA. But if you're working in, you know, um, perhaps in, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe um, uh, one of the countries in South America or, or Asia, and, and you know, the, the age might make a lot of difference and comorbidities might make a lot more difference and patient wishes. So it'd be nice to kind of, you know, um, highlight that, that treatments will vary according to um, the resources available to us uh, and the, the, the patient wishes and how, how physiological they are, how well they are physiologically. Absolutely, I agree. And, and not just that, even in the same country, as you'll know, most of yeah. them have just changed dramatically over, let's say, 10 years. A lot of the patients who I treat surgically yeah. In my training we wouldn't have treated surgically so so the, yeah there are constant change in sort of goals and targets yeah. and it does depend on resources to a degree and depends what else is available because surgery in this is, is, a, is a part of the management certainly not the the ultimate management or the main management alone and yeah you have to consider all those things that you, you point to so the, yeah different countries they will have different I think um, things to to keep in mind in terms of their health resources and all the rest of it. I agree. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just think it, it might be uh, so simple to sort of say this, but I think it's very good thing to to be borne in mind always that, for example, the current COVID crisis that's hit us all around the world is already affected. For example, what we do with cord compression because of the risk versus benefits of being in hospital. Uh, when you're immune suppressed and, and other things and radiotherapy and access to chemotherapy and so on uh, and how must how it must be uh, very variable from uh, around the world in terms of resources and um, and uh, quality of resources and facilities available but well, again I, I, I agree also I remember actually the week before we've sort of all of this started coming to the fray I, I operated on a lady which was sort of a query pancreatic cancer but unconfirmed I'm ready for spine cord compression I can um, operate it on her all fine, etc. But she's going to be a long hospital stay, definitely at risk of contracting coronavirus. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you, you know, unashamed to that if, if it were, she were presenting now, I think on balance, um, I wouldn't have offered it because I think the risks are higher than, so we, yeah, we do shift. I think, and yeah, that's a good example because even same surgeon, same setting, just different outside of um, sort of, um, factor has, has changed yeah. how I would treat, especially because there's a lot of grays, as you know, in neurosurgery in general, but more so in these patients. Rafi, there's a question, if I may say, yes, John, go ahead. from Rahul, go ahead, um, uh, from Rahul about uh, mechanism of nocturnal pain in, in such patients, he's asking. Um, um, can you can you comment on that, uh, Rafi? Um, uh, I think it's like, as with any other kind of cancer pain or, or infection pain, when, you're, you're, when you have something which is involved in the architecture of the spine and the pain receptors around it, then you will have pain, which I think the, it's not so much night pain per se, which, was no, which is known with certain types of sort of bone tumors. I think it's a bottom line, it's a, it's a pain which doesn't generally improve and doesn't depend on dependency alone, i.e. It's not a purely mechanical pain is what we're trying to say. So it's not that the patient will only have pain at night. And quite frankly, I don't, it's not something that I personally see, um, but it's something that the textbooks were right. And I think it was came from the era of when MRI scans were probably not around as much. I mean, now any patient with a cancer who has pain will have an MRI scan, again, in our type of health setting. 
happens. Yeah, I think it's, I'm not sure personally on the mechanism. And I think what you said is absolutely right. The, but there would be a mechanism and it reminds me of things like, um, you know, why is, um, um, why is hydrocephalus? Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and um, you know, death following, um, you know, an acute uh, raised intracranial pressure scenario with hydrocephalus or a colloid cyst or hydrocephalus worse in the early hours of the morning. And why is ICP higher? And the theory which has been produced by some work is that CSF production is higher in the early hours of the morning. Um, and it might be something to do with circadian rhythms. Um, so there is a mechanism, obviously. Maybe in this case, it's something to do with the inflammatory markers uh, uh, which are released. Um, I, I, I don't know, but it's certainly an, an entity. I don't think anyone's figured it out. I'm not aware of the precise reasons, but for sure, it's a very consistent pattern. Okay, shall I go on to the next case? There's one more question, uh, Rafid. Uh, can you comment on prognosis and life expectancy of primary disease, disease before you decide on, decide on treatment option? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's coming. So I would say, let me hold on to that thought, okay. to that question. Uh, okay. We're going to talk about it in the other treatment um, sort of um, strategy or, or principles when we want to go through them. I'm going to go through the next case. Um, this is a 70. <laughs> So can we ask the people join in to, to mute the, 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 the Yeah, it's okay. We'll get it. We'll get it. Okay, I got it. It was a bleeder. <laughs> it's been there's been tampon, that's great. Okay. So. <laughs> that's the John same thing. You can tell, you can tell John is in the emergency room. Well, you know, I gotta I gotta find it. It takes time, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a second case, a 71-year-old who presented with neck pain. Um, he had been seen for a, by, by the hematologist and um, was diagnosed with a myeloma on, on his, from his bloods. Um, and at the time, I mean, this is a very, uh, obviously quite summarized the case, he had had one dose of radiotherapy and the patient was neurologically intact. <laughs> Oops, sorry, and this is this is the scan, this is the MRI scan. So on the left of your screen is a T2 sagittal scan. You can see there's engulfment of two adjacent um, vertebral bodies. You can see that's reaching into the canal, just about compressing the cord, and, and you can see that compression on the on the axial scan on the right as well. Um, and then the um, the question here really is that this is we, I've said it's a myeloma. It's been diagnosed as a myeloma. You know, should we not continue with radiotherapy? So it's radio sensitive, you know, but it was referred to me. So in this, in this setting, I ask for a CT scan and it's a vital spy off and it's not done unless a surgeon asks for it. And this is, this is the CT scan. And I think most neurosurgeons will be, or spine surgeons will be a bit horrified and they see the gap here and it is horrifying. Um, and it's, it never ceases to amaze me how these patients remain ambulatory and, and with this basically. Um, but in any case, that's the scan. And I think most, again, even if not um, directly involved with these types of surgeries, we'll see that scan and think, okay, this, this needs to be fixed. And I think that's fair because there is mechanical instability here. But is there a way, I mean, this one is an obvious one in, so, in a lot of ways um, when you first look at it, but there is still a method, another scoring um, way to, 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 to come to a point. And I think, to give, to give a, a number value basically. And I find these helpful, not the, for the really obvious ones like the one I showed you, but when I'm, I'm in an hour in and I'm not too sure, then I'll revert to this. So it's either gonna support me to do an operation or it'll be support me to not do an operation if that makes sense. So it's something to back me up. And as you would expect, I mean, the, the higher the counts with this, the higher the count, generally, the, the worse uh, the stability, or, or it means there is instability when it's a higher count. Um, and you know we're talking above above 13 on this on this scale means there is instability. And there are things that I think would you would guess or most, most neurosurgeons would guess. And they include things like the location, so a, a junctional segment, um, so that's lower cervical C7 to thoracic, so the thoraco cervical area, uh, the lumbar thoracic junction. Those junctional areas are the are the ones which are, carry a higher points. Then you, ha you have issues re revolving around pain. And again, it's common sense of the pain, pain that is worse when somebody's standing up. 
and then disappears when they're laying down means that there's something mechanical going on. So when they have, when patients have that, that gives you an idea about instability. Elytic lesion is not good. So again, you know, people would have probably gasped when they saw that scan. Um, and yeah, elytic lesions are, are not as good as blastic ones or blastic ones is, is, is a strong bone. Um, and then you look at alignment and in that patient, which I showed you, there was slight kyphosis and subluxation. Um, and clearly if that's present, then, then again, it's a higher count towards instability. And then vertebral bone collapse, if there's it's over 50% collapse, it's, it's definitely higher points as well and, and indicates instability. And lastly, involvement of the posterior structure. So, you know, you can add these up or you can use it intuitively as a guide. Uh, but I, I personally do find it helpful in those um, uncertain cases, let's say, or, or the ones which I'm sort of thinking, is there, is there enough to justify an operation or is there enough to justify going with radiation treatment? Um, so in this case, you can see that, yeah, the anterior portion is involved. There's kyphosis, there's subluxation, there's, there's this involvement of the, the pedicle stroke facet on, on that side. Um, and, you know, and, and it's junctional. So calculate on all of these, it's a lytic lesion. Calculating all of these, I came up with a, um, the radiological instability score of 15. So it's unstable. So although it's a myeloma, it's unstable. And hence, um, I did offer surgery for this patient. And we can go into surgical techniques a bit more, but generally speaking, if there's a gap at the front, there's a, you know, you need to reconstruct that anterior column. And for me, that's a cage and a, and a plate. Uh, for this patient, I actually just did it from the front. And some may want to do it from the back as well, which I think is, is very reasonable. Um, I, for me, for this patient, I um, left them in a collar um, and um, monitored them with x-rays and basically just avoided a, a posterior fixation. But it, was, it would be very reasonable to do that and then rid them of their collar straight away. Uh, there's different arguments to, to each um, boy. Not necessarily that one is right, one is wrong. Um, and this is a summarization of the stabilization that techniques that we can use. I think you can use an, um, an open type fixation, um, anterior support. There's the, all the percutaneous techniques, which I think are a, an important part of malignant spinal cord compression surgery. And for vertebroplasty, not so much for stabilization, but it can help more with pain. But it may be that you, you use it as an augmentation to your surgery or cemented screws and staged procedures, which I'm, again, a fan of. Um, and this just shows a summary again of some of the techniques. So on, on the left, you'll see a, a scan of pedicle screws of an, an aspercutaneous pedicle screw patient. Generally speaking, when I do a decompression for these patients, it's usually from the back, but I usually achieve a very good decompression and that's by not just a laminectomy, but removing at least one pedicle, usually two, so I'm getting a, you know, a close to a 270 type decompression. And when you remove one pedicle, you can get in front of the cord and I tend to push tumor away from the cords in that way. So you're somewhat blindsided, but you can get to the, uh, an, an anterior quarter or the anterolateral part of the cords by removing a pedicle very safely. Sometimes I do it with neural monitoring if it can be organized. And, and again, generally speaking, if I can be minimally invasive, you know, these are tumor patients, you don't want to lose blood, you don't want to send them a long time, you don't want the risk of infection. So I generally do percutaneous fixations and then do a mini open in the middle, um, if I can. I mean, there's a picture of a, a tubular retractor there. Generally, I don't use those because the compression is usually um, over a segment. So I, I tend not to. Um, Here's another example of a staged procedure. And it's just more talking about technicalities. I think this is one of my patients with a uh, breast cancer met. So I did a uh, posterior pedicle screw fixation and then a lateral thoracotomy approach. Um, and for this patient, she had pretty much exhausted radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So I wanted to achieve a good debulking, maybe not quite a unblock vertebrectomy, but certainly the large majority of the bone and um, you would expect that if she were to succumb to the systemic disease before a recurrence here. Yeah. And these are just, um, this is just a, an example of a lateral approach. And I, I, I use an axial type approach if it was in the lumbar spine. And this is just pictures of uh, the incisions with the percutaneous pedicle screw fixation. It just avoids that big midline incision and, and blood loss.
Um, and the goals of this kind of um, fixation fusion is clearly we want to decompress the neural structures. We want to reconstruct spinal deformity um, and also phys physiological loading mechanisms. We want to unload them um, and we want to achieve stability and fusion. Um, so yeah, basically treat the instability. Again, that's another example. Um, Preoperative um, embolization. Sometimes I use it for yeah, renal cell cancer. Um, generally speaking, things like myeloma, it's not really that, it's not helpful. And then I'm on to another case. Was there, um, I think we can, now that I've spoken about, I'm still not on to the um, sort of overall patient factors. That, that will come in another case. But regarding stability, I don't know if there's any questions that people want to ask about stability, because that was, that was the main talk about stability. This is another patient, which actually I can go through this one while, while uh, people have logged on and thinking about any questions regarding instability and stability. So this is a 64-year-old lady, again, myeloma, and again, previous history of radiotherapy. She came in with um, reduced power in the right hand, some neck pain, and was on, I think, third line treatment for her myeloma. So hematologists were run, running out of ideas. There's a patient CT scan. So you can see there's um, lytic lesions of, of um, two bones. Um, and in between them, there's, a, there's another vertebral body which is affected. So, so C6, um, C7 less so, but T1 also. Um, and it's reached the pedicle at T1, um, pretty much on both sides. So it's, you know, so that's unstable at T1. And, you know, you can't bridge this just by removing T1 alone. I mean, the, both, both levels, that's the, C, uh, the C6, which is highlighted there. But they're both those, um, there's, a, there's a slightly better bone in the middle, but you need to span all three to achieve good stability. So this patient went on to have, and this is a MRI scan with some compression. So if it was this compression alone in a myeloma patient with normal bony architecture, then it would have been something for radiation treatments and chemotherapy. But for this patient, you know, having radiotherapy, she'll end up having kyphosis over time and, and you worry about further cord injury. So she went on to have this three-level colpectomy and anterior plates. And uh, again, like I said, I, I like doing thin stage. So the second stage was the posterior construct. And you can see that I've, I've treated the, the, the kyphosis, the, um, the anterior, um, the, the, she has an anterior reconstruction with the cage and also obviously a decompression. So I've achieved all that I wanted to. So before I go on to this next case, is there any, any questions about the stability almost or any, anything that you want to say about that? John, can I? Speak is it okay? Yeah. Um, I think there's, there's a few good questions if you want to make short comments on uh, if you can, Rafid. One is, um, um, I'm just trying to uh, the, the name, I think. Um, someone was asking about uh, prognosis before treatment. If you can comment, do you have a sort of a cutoff point in terms of prognosis six months, nine months, one year before you embark on fixation decompression? If you can comment on that, and then uh, there's another question about, from someone about, there's many classifications, which I sympathize with, um, but which one do you use in your daily setting? Uh, and the third question about, do you prefer long or short segment fixation? Do you have any comments about that? Okay, so the, what was the first question again? What's the prognosis? Do you have any Prognosis, questions? okay. So I rarely would ever operate on somebody with less than three months prognosis, virtually never, unless they have extreme pain and I use it as, an, as a very palliative uh, procedure, i.e. Uh, the palliative um, team are running out of ideas for narcotic treatments and I might use, and they've got extreme instability. And then we bite the bullets and say, you know what, they're having an operation, they might have an infection, they might be longer stay. However, there is so much pain that we want to treat them anyway. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, it's going to be over six months and then the more aggressive I am is going to be over um, one year. And, and again, like I said, I'll go to that sort of, more detailed classifications. For me personally, I use the Takahashi for that. But the Takahashi is, is I mean, although it's a validated score for, for prognosis in terms of cancer patients, we still, I still depend on, on the view of the oncologist in the same way that we know our patients. You know, they've been looking after this patients for a year or more, or, you know, they, they'll know what they've had, what's left in their locker, how long they think that patient can last for. 
So I, I asked them too. So and and it's a and it's a combination of both when I when I reach a conclusion of this patient's prognosis. But the general guide for me is less than three months, virtually never. Um, less than six months, unlikely. But over six months, yes. Um, that that would be the summary. And what was the the question about the? Um, so there's the, a that, that's very good. I think. Um, question about there's many classifications which one do you tend to use and i think you've already answered that but um, when your daily sort of work yeah so i'm going through them as i go along as in for different aspects again remember there's different principles here that you want to you want to bear in mind and at the end of this i'm going to go through my thought process on how i deal with these patients so that to summarize all the ideas how i personally think yeah um, um and i thought that would be helpful for people okay. so i'll come to that right at the end there's quite a lot of questions john may i just uh, oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. And, um, and other questions about short or long segment, if you can make some short comments, Rafi, do you prefer yeah. is there any formula, any, any guidance about? It depends what it is. Uh, it's a very, I mean, generally speaking, the, the, the principles of spine is fix long, fuse short. I mean, that's a summary. But um, if you have somebody with who you're going to provide an anterior construct for, then you can pretty much limit yourself to that because you're, you're you're giving them anterior stability, and then you can go from the back if you need to, and stabilizing at, at that segment. Um, yeah. You want above that one below. You don't need to go along anymore. However, if you've got something in the lumbar spine or the thoracic spine, and it is lytic, but you're you're not aiming to go from the front for whatever reason, either you don't have that technology available, you don't think the patient can sustain it, you don't think it's indicated because the patient's prognosis, then you want to go along because you want to offload that anterior segment. The bottom line is, Always, the principle is you want to ensure that your construct lasts longer than the patient. And it's a sad thing to say when I word it that way, but that is the truth. What you want is not that patient coming back with a failure of your construct. But equally, you don't want to damage the patients with a long operation when they're going to succumb to their. They, you know, these patients are going to succumb to their to their cancer at some point. So you don't want to you don't want to overdo it either. I think that's very. Very useful comments, Rafi. Uh, question of balance. The next question is about, I think you've already answered, is when do you do a 360 degree, 360, you know, front and back fusion, which I think you've already answered, but if you can make short comments about that. Again, it depends on what you want to achieve. So you want to, you want to put all these points, which I mentioned in, um, you want to put them in mind. So if you're looking for more, you may be that like you're looking for anterior stability, in which case you're, you, you're putting something anterior, like a cage. And they're probably you're nearly always in the thoracic or lumbar spine, and definitely in the in the in the context of cancer, I'll be supplementing that with something from the back. In the neck with a myeloma, um, I mean, I got away with that patient. Let's say in general, the 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 broader principle, if it is such a such an instability anteriorly, then you want to go front and back. But for that, you can equally though say if you're going to achieve a good reconstruction, either from the back or the front, there is a there is a role to monitor yeah. serial yeah. X-rays. Uh -huh. It's great. Rahul's asking autograft versus bone substitute if prognosis is bad, um, like around months. I mean, any comments about type of graft that you use? I mean, generally speaking, the patient is going to succumb before your fusion. So what we're looking for here is more fixation rather than fusion. I mean, a solid fusion in, in the spine can take well over a year. I mean, I think people yeah. underestimate how um, long it takes because you do CT scans on wh whatever you put. I mean, I don't use BMP. It's not used much in this in this country but you know when i use uh, the bone substitutes like graft on a dbm type uh, material demineralized bone matrix it does take a long time to fuse and, and again with these patients you're looking for a solid fixation i don't think you're looking for fusion maybe in the myeloma patient which i showed you but even then when i've been talking to hematologists and i i was under the impression that myeloma had a very good prognosis and they're telling me that you know you're looking at four or five years or something in these kind of patients who reach or even less, um, who, who reached third line treatment. So, you know, all these patients are gonna succumb to the disease. So it's a matter of having something which saves their spine until that happens. So I don't think you're, I, don't, I wouldn't worry about thinking too hard about fusion because the pr probably you're, you're not gonna get to that stage. So I would be more thinking about your fixation. But if yeah. you get it, I wouldn't definitely go taking bone from the pelvis because it's another small procedure and why you put them through that morbidity. If there's some local bone, which isn't involved with the cancer for sure, use it. Usually your local bone is going to be involved with the cancer, so you can't use it. So almost inevitably, you're going to use some DBM, which is fine. Or yeah, something like that. Very useful, Rafid. Um, some uh, participants are really getting their money's worth here, but lots of questions. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Shall I get another glass of wine? Oh yeah, go ahead. 
can I, can I, okay, give me, give me one minute. Yeah, 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 just one minute. We're establishing a first, getting wine while he's presenting. John, is it okay if Rafi comes back we ask to answer more questions? Yeah, okay? sure, whatever. Whatever, it's free form. Yeah. But I'm glad there are questions. It's good to have yeah. people interacting. Well, yes, absolutely. I think this is the thing. And so um, you, you can just prioritize <laughs> the questions yeah. because yeah. you would understand the yeah. you know the question better than me. Um, no problem. Um, I'll try. So, Rafi, I think um, again a, a, a principal question here is in in which primary tumor you would consider vertebral column resection. So your your extent of resection, which primary tumors would you say to be more aggressive for? Well, I mean, it's going to be the sarcomas, so basically something malignant that you catch it before it's metastasized outside of that primary area. So something that you can cure. And I'll be honest with you, it's not something that we do in our center, generally speaking. So we have quite subspecialized um, bone tumor primary centers in, in the UK, and that's the, yeah. that's the practice in this country. But it's going to be something which is localized to that area, so it's not palliative anymore and you can achieve a cure. So those are the principles that you have in mind with it. So the talk is about malignant spine cord compression. So by nature, this patients have already disease outside. So there is maybe some role for vertebrexomy in very select patients. However, overall, my view is you really need to think hard because it is a morbid operation. Whatever people want to say about it, there is some comorbid, you know, significant comorbidities for it. So you have to you have to think hard about Absolutely that. Absolutely right. Yeah, it's best to um, be realistic and uh, look at your aims. So um, a quick comment, if you have any, it's probably not the most relevant in terms of the talk, but any role for SRS in patients with less than three months life expectancy with um, with compression? Well, yeah, because the. I think SRS is an alternative to surgery, and I skipped through the slide, to be honest with you, about um, the guidance in the UK for SRS, and we have quite strict guidance. So if you have, and some of this may be sort of a cost efficiency type thing, I think the role of SRS um, in spine is gonna expand. Um, that's my view. And I think when you look at the data, it tells you that about 70% um, achieve good pain control. So it could be something for pain. And there's, there's all sorts of options for pain. You could be, it could be a fixation if it's mechanical, it could be a vertebroplasty, it could be the SRS, it could be radiotherapy in general, but SRS has probably got higher, a higher chance and obviously less visits. And it's more so in this kind of circumstance where they go for their one blast rather than keep going back for sessions of radiation treatments mm -hmm. uh, and 10 sessions or so. Or so. so yeah, it's got a role for that. And also it's got your, a, a role for a cure, cure or local, local cure, as in at the, at the area. And it can achieve up to 90%. But obviously, with somebody of a prognosis of three months, that's not too relevant. So the, uh, the argument for that would be for pain. And yeah, then you, you, you judge what you have available to you. I think there's many tools here. And it's, it's about what your health setting is, what's best for the patient, and, um, and, and that kind of discussion. No, that's, that's great, Rafi. There's actually quite a lot of questions. Um, uh, just trying to prioritize, but um, a comment, if you can, from Rahul regarding wide margin versus radical resection uh, indications. Again, you know, we know this is a talk about malignant cord compression, and the majority of these have got metastatic disease. But yeah, and the, the, the only thing to summarize for that muscle is personally, when I do the decompression, and as I showed in one of the pictures, is I remove the pedicles. I mean, I try, I don't want to go to do it staged if I can avoid it. Again, these are patients who are who don't have great prognosis. So you want to limit your operation, but I remove the pedicles because I think that achieves a good, safe decompression. So you don't have that posterior one where the cord can come back at you. And I think then patients can go off their legs. So, I mean, thankfully I've not had a patient who, who has been worse post-op. And I think it's because I removed the pedicles and then I come, come um, anterior to the cord then you can safely come to the anterolateral part of the cord on both sides if you want to. So I can debulk that tumor, which has come um, through the posterior vertebral body. Um, and yeah, you want to achieve a margin because you want these patients are inevitably going to go for radiotherapy. Personally, I wait for three weeks after and send them for radiotherapy after the wound has healed a bit. So you want you want a margin basically. There's you know you want a tumor clearance margin. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to measure that in millimeters, etc. But you want you you want to have room around the cords. In summary, that's great. Um... Rahul just made a sort of another question related to the thing about SRS. Um, so he's asking, so I think you need some distance between the lesion and the cord before you apply SRS. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, and, I would do, 
and that's the when the role for surgery, I guess, is when there is that cord compression. But like I mentioned in the previous slides, is it depends on the on the degree of the cord compression. I mean, there's different stages that it, it could be just the bulge outside the bone, and that's in the canal, but there's still some margin. And it depends on the on the um, radiolucency of the tumor. So something, and, and you can get good outcomes when there's not frank cord compression, um, and especially for the malignancies like um, lymphoma, myeloma, et cetera. In fact, surgery is not good for them when you have these alternatives. Why treat them with surgery when you can treat them with radiation treatments, whether it's SRS or not? Oh, that's great, thank you. So uh, there's another case that I have, and this is a sure. brief one, I think. Excuse to okay. everybody, we better get on with the, with the rest of it, if that's okay, thank you. Uh, so for <laughs> 47 year old lady, this was with a history of um, breast, uh, right side of breast cancer, no positive, started on chemotherapy, and she had a solitary met at T10. Um, and I think this may be a patient who did have radiotherapy to this site, I can't remember. Um, but this, this, is her, this is her MRI scan. So you can see there's, there's collapse of the vertebral body. You can see that um, it's is um, the tumor is extended from the posterior part of the vertebral body to the to the canal and the theca and reached the cord and compressing the cord. Um, so it's probably a grade two if you rem or remember the grading um, um, scale that I showed you. Um, and this is the CT scan again. It's crucial to look at these CT scans. You can see there's pretty much absent bone at some areas. Um, you know, definitely more than 50% of the bone and it's, and it's reaching the pedicle at one side. Um, and she ended up having a front and back, so a lateral approach to, uh, to, to reconstruct the spine. I mean, there is an argument that you go maybe two or three levels above and below. Um, I think she was running out some options or the, the I think from memory that she, this was a type of breast cancer which was not radio sensitive. So I thought debulking some of this would, would help her as well. And that's the other reason to go for an, um, anterior approach as well as a posterior. Um, you know, could you go one above, one below? Probably not quite for this, but it's an option. Um, there's, you could go three above, three below and not do the anterior construct there. Uh, what I'm trying to say is there's more than one technical option for these patients. Um, and this is her scan afterwards and you can see that the cord is decompressed at, the, at that level. I think the other reason I went from the front is to, to decompress away from the theca. Um, and again, this is a CT scan afterwards for that patient. So this is what some of the questions we're asking about, you know, what, when, when do you choose to operate on those patients? And I answered some of them already, but this is that fourth principle, which is systemic disease and medical comorbidity. And um, for me, I depend on the Takahashi. It was just something that I used in training as a validated score. And, but like I said, I don't depend solely on it. I do ask the oncologist, I think it's good have a good relationship with your oncologist. So whoever's treating that patient, pick up the phone and talk to them because uh, they will know that patient well. Um, you know, not every colorectal cancer is the same. They'll, they'll have their nuances and what's available to them. And, and there's probably new treatments that we just don't know about. So it's better to talk to the oncologist and they'll give you an idea of their prognosis as well. The only caveat to that, I do find some oncologists to be overly, um, what's the word, optimistic, overly optimistic about their patients. So yeah, and that's my my experience, but I think it's because they they want to look after their patients, and they sometimes feel that surgery is the way for them, so they they're pushing as hard as they can towards that. So something to bear in mind, but it depends on the locality you're at. But keep keep this one in mind because if I've had patients who they've said, oh yeah, their prognosis is over a year, I come and calculate, and it's much worse than you know they might be scoring close to zero, and I'm like, I'm sorry, but I just don't think this patient's going to pull through. Um, so it's good to have an objective measure in addition to that. So I think both, both are important pillars, your oncologist and this scoring mechanism. And this looks at overall things like your performance status, the number of metastases within the spine, and the number of metastases in, in the solid organs and the type of the tumor. So all these things, um, this counts. And, and also um, the neurological function of the patient, which will indicate prognosis as well, clearly somebody with um, complete loss of cord function is not going to have a good of prognosis as somebody who's walking around. Um, and and in the, on the Takahashi score, generally under eight equals um, you know under six months prognosis, and you want to think you want to be thinking about conservative management. Um, when it's um, over nine, then you, you're thinking about surgery, and when it's very good and over a year, then you're thinking more about excisional treatments and um, 
oncological clearance. So there's different principles. Um, this is another, another patient, 74 year old, two, two week history of progressive leg weakness. Uh, it wasn't able to stand. Um, it had a catheter inserted, power with, between two and three in the lower limbs. It had a raised PSA. This is a new, a new um, diagnosis of a prostate cancer. He couldn't have an MRI scan because of a pacemaker. So he had a CT scan and it showed likely compression at T7, 8 and a normal CT chest abdomen and pelvis. So this is the CT scan that you had. And again, sometimes you're faced with these situations that you don't have too much information to go on. You can see on the axial scan that there is involvement of the canal. I and mean, the patient clearly has got poor neurology. So there's not too much options for him. I mean, you could send him for radiotherapy. He didn't have a histological diagnosis, it was a presumed one. So we needed histology. Um, I felt that the best thing for him, although prostate can be responsive to radiation treatments, especially with some of it, this being lytic, I thought the best thing would be surgery. And, and this patient had um, one of those uh, percutaneous fixations that I mentioned and, and decompression of the pedicles and anterior cords at the level of compression. And because the, the adjacent bone was involved, I've cemented those screws and it's just to provide a stronger construct. There's no, again, not one size fits all for these type of patients. So you can see here's an axial of that decompression. See, I've removed the pedicle um, on both sides, uh, more so on, on one side. I keep the outer shell of it because I'm, it's not that you want to remove the whole pedicle. You just need to access the, um, the, the part of the spine anterior to the theca. So it's just to get a safe access and to, to get a good decompression. Um, this is a summary of, of um, the algorithm, but I won't go through that. Instead of, I'll just go through what I do. It's a summary of the things I look at. So I ask myself, you know, how well is this patient? So like, like I explained before, definitely a Takahashi and, and comorbidities and, and an oncologist saying it's under three months, virtually never would I offer an operation in my practice unless it was for severe instability pain where there was failure of pain treatments. Um, and then I might offer a quick fixation, a percutaneous fixation for them. If it's under six months again, probably not. Over six months, I probably will. So that's one of the first things I'm asking about is what the tumor is. Have they had a CT chest abdomen, pelvis? I want to ask those questions. You know, have they had an up-to-date stage and scan? Um, second question I'm thinking of is what's the histology of this? I mean, I need that anyway for, for the prognosis. Uh, but what I'm thinking here is, is radiotherapy a, a good option for them? And that's for myeloma and lymphoma. We know they do very well from oncological um, response point of view to radiotherapy. I mean, if the patient's not had histology, even though there's a presumption, that's a, a, that's a strong thing to depend on. So you, you're probably, your hand might be forced towards surgery because there is no histology. There is no answer. Um, and yeah, you can try the hematological test. Sometimes they take time. Sometimes there's, you have borderline results and sometimes you don't have the time to wait because the patient's power is going off. So you need to make that decision. Um, then I'm thinking, so it's almost, you know, what people will think of to, to begin with, which is the compression, I come to later. And so then it's the epidural compression and I'm, is it high grade, is it low grade? Is the, is the cord compressed? Um, if the cord is compressed, then yeah, I'm thinking about surgery here. Um, if there is absolutely no cause compression, then I'm thinking more towards radiotherapy because it's only within the vertebral body. I'm thinking about SRS. If there's good prognosis only within the vertebral body, I'm thinking about SRS. So there's all these different factors to think about. And then I'm thinking about stability and, and um, oncologists obviously will not think about this, but you need to as a spine surgeon, you're a surgeon. And the first thing I ask for in, in, in our um, um, and multiple disciplinary meetings show me the CT scan that almost used to me and they bring it up when they see me. And I'm looking at a sagittal CT scan, looking for all the things that we mentioned. Is it junctional? Is it lytic? Is there pain? Is the po other posterior elements involved? And then if I want any help, then I look at the score, the uh, spine instability score. And um, if there's risk of instability, then I'll look for stabilization for that. And like I said, you want to discuss with your local oncologist. And if you have a radiation oncologist, you want to discuss with them as well. And I think that's the, that's the end of my um, slides. More so, I don't know if you have any other questions and if people thought that was helpful or not. So I'm just trying to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Rafi. That was all really, really excellent summary, really. It was so good. You've reached the moon behind it. I, I, I also got a bit excited when I figured out how to change my background and, and remove the embarrassing scene of my... Oh, there you go. My study. Um, uh, there is some um, from Rahul. He's got some um, 
more you know, good questions. Um, yeah, perhaps Rahul could. Rahul, do you have a good connection? You can come on and ask those questions directly because you seem to have a lot of questions. Do you have a good connection, Rahul? If he doesn't, we'll be glad to read them and just read at your priority. Do you want to unmute him, John? Is he unmuted? Uh, let's see here. No, he's been the. He knows what he's doing. He's been here before. I've okay. seen him at the neurosurgery one. Uh, well, perhaps just go through the written ones, uh, Mahood. Uh, um, so Rahul's asking if we were going to take a biopsy as the first line investigation, do you prefer to do it fluoroscopic either, you know, x-ray guided or do you want to do a CT guided? Um, I mean, generally speaking, it's more, it's more on the x-ray or, or radiologist. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's usually convenience of our practice. And if, if it's uh, any surgical procedure, I usually... Can you hear me? I think uh, John. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, if it's uh, if it's something that needs to be just a biopsy alone, then I would usually send it for a CT guided biopsy. I mean, you could probably do it with an X-ray if you wanted to through the pedicle. It's obviously not a problem. And and if you're doing a vertebroplasty, then for sure, just do it there and then. Mm. That's um, just convenience of practice. I send them to the radiologist, and yeah. obviously, it's probably better anyway with a CT rather than us. Um, yeah. It's easier. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Rahul, again, about the role of kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty for the worst prognosis uh, patient. Do you prefer those, uh, he says, at least uh, for palliative care? I know, I mean, it's a helpful, it can, can be helpful for pain, um, but then also pain re response to radiation treatment. So mm. I think it's a balance, but it's generally a straightforward surgical procedure. Um, if, if there's involvement of a few vertebral body patients in pain, for sure. I mean, there's also um, the option of um, radio frequency, which is coming out, and they're all playing on the same thing, which is a local palliative, ablative sort of procedure to reduce pain. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, there's an option to do, and I do, do so much of it in my daily practice usually is for instability and cord compression, but yeah, something definitely that you need to have. Oh, that's great. He's asked another question, it's a bit more worrying. I for think my he's, a, he's a potential he fellow. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, he says, how do you manage a case of negative biopsy? <laughs> probably take another one. I mean, if there's definite scan problem, as in there's a, there's, a, there's a pathology on the scan, a negative biopsy means that for whatever reason, it's just not picked up the right sample and you want to take another sample. So if it was done CT guided, you can go for another one. I mean, definitely, if you've had two uh, negative ones, then you may want to do an open biopsy. Generally speaking, it's not something I see in practice. Oh, that's great. Um, um, there's a Any comment more questions here? No. Do you see any more questions? No. Yes. Um, well, there's a comment um, okay. from, from Kashur. Um, he's basically saying that nocturnal pain is one of the characteristics of cancerous lesions of the spine and the theory of uh, cortisol circadian rhythm uh, circadian level is reasonable plus the biological pain which is magnified by the recumbent position during sleep i mean this is all you know very valid oh, oh, oh. good yeah. comments um, um uh, and uh, kartik is just mentioning that um in the lying down position, the tumor compresses epidural venous plexus, and then the venous return reduces, and pain is felt due to venous engorgement. Again, you know, this is, these are all, if you actually Google this, the, all these comments come up, and I think these are all very useful. Um, this is the benefit of the internet. We can really interact so massively acutely and, um, and share these theories. Uh, and I think they're all valid. Uh, what do you think, Rafid? Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, the bottom line is, like I said, from a practical sense, I mean, obviously, yeah, we all want to understand the pathogenesis and all the rest of it, but from a practical sense, have somebody with pain um, who's got a history of cancer, you're going to scan them. And then the bottom line is having that low threshold. We want that low threshold. I wouldn't worry too much about how much pain when the pain is. I mean, pain in a cancer patient in their spine equals a scan, and, and you just want to get, get on and do that. Yeah. Um, John, do you have any... Any comments you want to make? Yeah. To well, I just have, I'm not a back surgeon. I'm just a regular doctor. But one, one thing, question I do have, nocturnal pain is one of the characteristics of cancerous lesions of the spine. I did not know that. And so that's typical when you have a patient with back pain, has a bony lesion, it's probably cancerous. 
if it, they have it at night. I mean, it's probably worrying, John. It's not necessarily cancerous because you can have it with infection, you can have it with TB, but it means something worrying or pathological is going on in the spine. It's suspicious, it's suspicious, my, my, yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding, generally, okay. or what I see. Um, but yeah, you can have it. Typically, there's some typical ones which have been mentioned in the textbooks, and the guys online have mentioned various reasons for, and it may, be, may well be the case of these theories of why um, they have more pain. But again, I think this day and age, you, people present earlier, probably. Um, well, in, 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 at least in, in the patient population that I see, you know, they have pain with a the cancer, they're going to come. Um, they're worried. So they, they're going to get their scan. Right. So, um, okay. Okay, any more questions, comments? There's a couple. A couple. The car, car check is very inquisitive. That's great. That's great. Uh, did you see his last question there? Yeah, okay. yeah basically. Um, well, there's a comment from Alberto, and he's saying that uh, nice talk, uh, Rafid. Um, what do you think about thermal therapies and vertebral tumors? Yeah, well, that is the radio frequency I mentioned. Um, uh, which is what well, uh, Medtronic do that now or offer that um, option, which is yeah type of thermal treatments. Um, and I think it's, it probably has a role, but what I and I, you know, I've learned how to do it, but I, I didn't find there was much um, many patients for it. I think it depends what else you have available, but I think if you have SRS, then probably the number of patients that you're going to have, which this um, helps and, and SRS doesn't. Is not going to be and vertebral plastic doesn't is not going to be many. I think if you have no availability of SRS, then I think it may be a good option. Um, I know some centers seem to like it, so I think it's a good thing to know of and, and have the ability to sort of use because it does have some local good control rate, but it doesn't reach the local control rate. I think they quote something around 70 to 80 percent from memory local control. Whereas if you compare it to um, SRS, which is 90%, then you think, well, there's not that much value of that. And if you think of it from a pain management perspective, then you think again, why not radiation treatments or why not vertebroplasty? I do think it has a role, but I think again, it's sort of selecting that patient or it's an alternative to some other thing. So maybe if SRS is, is limited, like we have here, um, as in there's a lot of guidance of who may have it, then maybe you use it before your vertebroplasty. I've seen some centers do. So yeah, there's, there's, there can be a role for it. Well, you know, I think I think Kartik is, is is a spine specialist because of the questions I don't understand. Uh, he, he says, as in mourning, the ligament tends to pull infected bones away as a compensatory me mechanism. Well, I don't know what he means by that. Um, do, do you know what they means by that, that uh, Mahood? No. Um, <laughs> I, I, yes, but it's a, it's again a, a, a less wonderful theory, but nevertheless valid. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Someone asked a comment on pediatric. Pediatric. Um, oh my word. Um, well, I mean, generally, pretty, pretty, pretty malignant, malignant spine cord compression is going to be a disease of adults. So we, you know, we, and um, I my mean, personally, my practice is an adult one, but you don't see this in children. You don't see malignant spine cord compression in children. So I think if they're asking very rare, huh? pediatrics, they're probably talking about primary tumors, which is again rare, but not really the topic of, of today. Is no. there a role in HIFU or LITT therapy? A role of which? HIFU, H I F U, HIFU. Not sure what that's, that's, some, that's some type of high frequency uh, uh, ultrasound. Uh, I, I've not, heard not. that. They, I don't, I don't, I mean, there may be, but not something I know of. And okay, I know in neurology that has, that has applications, but I, I don't know of spine, I don't no. know. I don't None know. that I know of, of in spine personally, and not something yeah. I would uh, Alberto's broken it down to say laser interstitial thermal therapy for LITT. I, I, I'm, I'm not I mean, it may be the same as, I mean, you know, there is obviously there's a treatment coming out now for brain tumors as well. Um, and it's gonna be the same. It depends on thermal destruction and local control. So. There's all these different methods, but I don't think one differs massively from the other, i.e. if you have the probe and radio frequency like um, Medtronica do, or you, you um, do, do the SRS, or you do this laser, it's probably there or thereabouts. Not something that I use in my personal practice, but I would think that they're all targeting the same sort of area, or the same strategy. 
I mean, it's just more of a comment, Rafi, that people, there's so many different therapies out there for pretty much everything. I mean, and I'm thinking of, for example, laser therapy for, for, for intradiscal therapy, we're using laser yeah. and, and heat. And so people are doing all kinds of things. But for me, as, as long as, until it's kind of really working out well for, a, for patients or a group of patients, um, uh, I'm not aware of it to be adopted in any yeah, way. Yeah, absolutely. You want the evidence there. And, and for something like the ra- even the radio frequency and the, he- the heat um, stuff, which I mentioned, they, they haven't done the big RCT. So you're right. When you're using that, you are, you are do- using something new. And that's why it's probably best to use it for things like pain, because you could probably justify it a bit more. But the, the evidence isn't strongly behind it. Um, John, John um, one of the comments is the volume seems to be gone. Audio volume just got too low. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's a problem of his computer because we all I hear am. we all hear well here. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. But, <laughs> Turn up your volume, I think. Uh, yeah, I I think what? my volume is fine. Anyway, so, well, John, can we just summarize? I think I hope everybody found that useful. And can, should we say that me and Mansoor are happy to give a few other talks? And we say in tomorrow is tomorrow at seven. We think it may be a good time. Uh, okay, we'll touch base after because I have a okay. couple of things going on. Right on. But uh, yeah, yeah, let's wrap this up. Uh, just uh, we can we can end it and still stay here, but just so I can yeah. you know, organize you. the talks. And thank you very much for this talk, and we look okay. forward to many more. Thank you. Yeah, very good, rapid, excellent. A lot of positive comments. Thanks, John. Okay, okay. Thanks, now everybody. we we got open time. We can do what we want now. Because we can okay. edit all this out. Now, Carlos, so Car- Carlos is mentioning <laughs> something he wanted to do. Yeah, Daddy, Daddy, uh, Daddy K. John, yes. thank you very much. Um, I I couldn't get the volume at the uh, latter end of the presentation, but it's been a beautiful uh, interactive session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Dr. Kenu. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, uh, Carlos, Carlos mentioned wanting to do something now. Carlos, did you say you wanted to do something? Carlos Humaguano, he's a, he's a neurosurgeon from Ecuador and Spain. He may have stepped away. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, any, uh, yeah, tomorrow is a seven o'clock. What time is that? That's um, one o'clock. That should be okay. Muscle, do you want to do one of yours or we want me to do one of mine? Do you have anything no, on no. ACH, Muscle? Uh, tomorrow, oh, wait a minute. I have a Spanish one on at noon, which is one o'clock my time. Uh, so probably later in the afternoon, would that, would that work for you guys? I mean, I could, I've got lots of talks which I can do and I, I can give you some suggestions and the timing can be flexible, but I could do one next week um, or do one a week or something. But my thing is, you know, if people are interested about knowing the nuances in detail or what specific question, matters are related to complex CSF or vascular stuff, I've got some good talks which I could do for colloid cysts or Chiari malformation, um, complex hydrocephalus endoscopic techniques. If you want videos to be shown, I've got over 500 of them. Oh. Um, and uh, I've got lots of case series, but I think a good one to consider is do one on colloid cysts because there seems to be a lot of nuances there. People want to know the latest. Um, yeah, that would be great. That, that would be good. If you could give me a title for that and uh, we'll do it next week. We'll do it um, next week. Sure. Okay, we could do one on um, colloid cysts and management of colloid cysts. Okay. Well, management of colloid so do you want to do week. that tomorrow, also or next week? Um, I think um, tomorrow I might be... <laughs> Bit busy, but um, I could certainly do it next week if that's okay with you. Yeah, why don't we do it next week? Because I, I'm kind of busy tomorrow too. Uh, sure, let's do next week, and uh, people can prepare their questions and really go into depth. Yeah, I, I, I can, can show some videos if, if but I'm, I'm I need to rehearse to make sure the video shows. If it's not, then yeah. I can just show well, lots of Tell you what, Monsoor, then when do you want to do it on the weekend or on the weekday? Weekend would be better, I think. Uh, if that's so, okay. then. Then in that case, shall I do one, John, on Thursday at 7 p.m.? Also, are you available? Yeah, that would be good. That would be, yeah, that would be good. Because Thursday is okay. Thursday is generally a slow day. Okay, so, so Thursday, 7 p.m., I'll do one on pituitary. I'll send you the title. But Great. like I said, when you send it out, just put global neurosurgery, John. And then okay. and then Monsor will come along as well on 7 p.m. Thursday. Monsor, you're available? Uh, 
should be. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Well, okay. the, the, you know, that's the thing about this platform. You could take a global neurosurgery and brand that for your talk, your night, your your time. Well, exactly. Global. We have also will be global neurosurgery. Yeah. Okay. Well, that no problem. Um, John, I can also do one, um, which is a very passionate subject of mine, and, and I really invite questions and people internationally to kind of join the European Association of Neurological Surgeons, where we're leading on a sort of development of CSF specialty. But if people are really keen to know about Chiari malformation type one and all right. the nuances in its management, very okay. happy to do a long, you know, a good presentation on that. Um, yeah, that would be great. So I could do, we could do two, I'm happy to do two sometime next weekend or sometime next week, maybe one end of the week, one the week after, one on colloid cyst management and one on Chiari malformation. Um, all you've ever wanted to know about Chiari 1 malformation, we call okay. it that. Okay, yeah, we'll, I'll be talking to Rafid and we'll come to some kind of arrangement. So okay. we're not okay. We can call it all you ever wanted to know but was too afraid to ask, like a Woody Allen movie. Oh, really? <laughs> he, I don't think he's shy. <laughs> Okay, John, thank you. I'm off. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you very have, much. A good day. have a good day, gentlemen. Have a very good day. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Carlos, are you there? I think he stepped away because he mentioned he wanted to do something. Uh, and uh, let me see here. Uh, Dr. Daddy K, I think it's your computer that's the problem with the sound. Are you there still, Dr. D D Dr. Kenu? Yeah. Yeah, the volume dropped uh, after a while, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, but um, it's okay. I, I, I was able to uh, cut most of the presentation. Okay, it's all recorded, so I'll send you a copy of the recording. Uh, good evening, Thank you John. Very much, John. I, I was also able to get some of my colleagues to join. And, uh, oh, yeah, please do. Uh, please do. Please yeah. do. Abdullah, Abdullah, how are you? Good, good how are you doing? How are you doing today? I'm good, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So, how is everything? I joined the meeting late. That's okay. You're welcome yeah. to come anytime. All right. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you want to present next week. Ah, uh, not now. I okay. left Rabat. I'm now in Nigeria. I'm briefly back because of the corona. Okay. Yeah, so uh, not maybe I will prepare some other time to present, but not okay. Immediately. No problem, no problem, right? No problem, thank you. Kanu, okay. are you still there? Kennedy from not from, Hello, Kanu. Yeah, Kanu, from, yeah. Ken, from Kenya. Kanu. Oh, uh, how are you? Kanu is a uh, is Jimo, Jimo speaking. Jim, I can hear you well. I can hear okay, you. Okay, so you. <laughs> how is Lagos? How is everything? <laughs> Oh, we're getting on. We're getting on. Okay, my regards uh, please, to everybody there. Please. Okay, please stay safe. Huh? Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, so John, um, I have to leave now, so some other time. Okay, very good. Nice, nice of you to come. All right, thank you. Bye -bye. See you we'll see you next time. Okay, goodbye, John. All goodbye, right. John. Bye-bye. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, right. anybody anybody else want to say anything? Okay. Hey, John. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for these forums. I'm certainly learning a lot. Now, who is this? I can't see the name there. It's, it's, oh, it's, Kennedy, it's, Kennedy. Okay, you, yeah, you, you took your, your picture off. That's good. Because yeah, you, yeah, the, that's a, of, yeah, you're smart. That saves bandwidth. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to convey my thanks for this forum. It's certainly, I'm learning a lot. Well, you and Zolo are taking advantage of it. That's that's a good thing. It's, you know, it's good that you guys recognize that it's useful and it's free. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, you know, just, to, <laughs> you know, sometimes just to listen, you may not understand a lot of it, but just to be around it and to start yeah. thinking, thinking in a disciplined fashion to problems. Uh, it's certainly useful, even if you don't know what some things are. So, it, yeah, it's very good, and I'm also trying to get uh, some of uh, my classmates to also be joining in. Well, we can go wherever you guys want to go. I, I would like to have classes for medical students to have medical students.
present medical school topics. Um, and we've gone over this with, with uh, Zolo of uh, Cameroon, but uh, we'll slowly get that going. In the meanwhile, we'll we're, we're getting increased interest with these talks. We're getting better at interactivity. This morning, we had a, a webcast. We had more than 100 panelists. And it was very manageable because basically uh, we made people uh, write the questions down and read them. And that saved a lot of problems. Because as you know, you know, a lot of people don't have the bandwidth and the questions get garbled and they don't understand. But we're, 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 getting, we're getting better. The one this morning was very interactive and people were muting quickly asking the question and muting, and it was great. There was a lot of interactivity. And when these sessions have interactivity, it's gold, it's gold, because that's the main advantage of them. Mm. So uh, we'll get better at, at you know how we manage them. So, okay, we got to, I'm gonna get ready this, this one. I guess Carlos uh, stepped away. But we have a one, let me show you actually, gentlemen, because I've got to get better. I've got to run this like a TV uh, station. Hello. Okay. How are you, Dr. John? Hello. Who's it? Kabulo. Oh, Dr. Kabulo, you've been quiet today. Yes, my internet connection at some point was very bad. Oh, really? Yeah. It's okay now, though, huh? Yes. Well, uh, hello everyone. Hello, Dr. Igo. That's Dr. Kabolo, a neurosurgeon from the Congo. Hi, try. Kabulo. Hello, Dr. Kabulo. Hello, hello, hello Dr. Johnny Seagull. Hey, there's Zolo. I'm fine. Good. Hey, did you get your supplies? Let me see here. I'm trying to get. Okay, here we go. Okay, how are you? Sure. I'm very fine, Doctor Kabulo. Thank you. Where I've are you been, from? I, I've, I've, I'm from Kenya. Wow, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I've been going through uh, John's archives, and I also saw your pineal uh, original tumor uh, presentation, which was very good. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Hey, Dr. Kabula, you're speaking next week, right? Are you, are you thinking about it? Sorry? Are you going to speak next week? Uh, I think Zola was yes. mentioning. Yes, I will say by tomorrow, I will talk to you. I think I give you my topic tomorrow. Okay, great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Kabula has been with us from the very start. Yeah. <laughs> from the first day, I think. <laughs> So, okay, uh, let me just show you, uh, let me, hold on, I'm gonna show you. Uh, let me show you the, uh, what's on tomorrow. It's in Spanish, I don't know if you wanna, if it, I think Lucindo speaks Spanish, okay? This is uh, Principles, Objectives in the Surgery of Glioma and the Importance of Intraoperative MRI. Uh, but, you know, the, the Robert, Roberto is giving that in English next Thursday for the, uh, for the daily dose in the morning. But in, he's giving this one tomorrow in Spanish. So I don't know how many of you guys speak Spanish, but uh, you're welcome to, to come if you want. So, okay, I gotta, I'm going to go out and go out and take a, get some exercise today, maybe. So we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, shortly. Thank you so much, Doctor Bennett. Yeah, uh, every day I pass his daily dose, Doctor Gabul. Every day. Okay, every day the daily cocktail. <laughs> yeah, that's it. There you go. Okay, goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Same to you. Okay.